What are the Hellenists? Can I say that? Next on the Midweek Move. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Midweek Move. It is Scott again, and again we have with us uh, theologian on campus and online, Dallas Mora. Dallas, how are you today? I'm well. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great. Hey, we have been walking through the book of Acts. Man, it has been an incredible journey. It has. We've had some chapters with 40-plus verses. Today, <laughs> we have a chapter in which we have 15 verses, but in these 15 verses... There is a lot happening in these 15 verses. There's a whole lot happening and for just a little chapter. That's absolutely. So Acts chapter number 6, that's where we are today. So let's go to that together. Acts chapter 6, uh, if you're on your device, if you have one of these, which is known as a leather-bound Bible. Nice. I think mine's faux leather. Actual paper. <laughs> this is actual paper here. All right. So Acts chapter 6. Now, we left off uh, last week. Uh, with Acts chapter 5, where uh, they've been in and out of jail, they've been persecuted for simply speaking the name of Jesus, forbidden, quote-unquote, to speak the name of Jesus. They, um, You would think with everything that's happening, like revival is happening, awakening is happening in Jerusalem, it's starting to spread out a little bit. Mm -hmm. You would think in that, that everything would be going awesome and great and wonderful, but in the midst of all that, they're being thrown in jail. Right. They're being persecuted, but in the midst of all that, they're multiplying. More people are coming to Christ. More people are becoming disciples of Jesus. They're discipling people. You've got apostles. You've got disciples. You've got converts. You've got all this going on. You've, right. got, you've got Jews everywhere who are coming into this full revelation of Jesus as Messiah, which was huge. It was a massive deal. Major deal. And... You've not only got just one segment of Jews here. You've got religious Jews. You've got Jews who have been dispersed to other regions now who are hearing about Christ mm -hmm. and are coming back to this. You've got in the middle of the feast. All of these things are happening, which brings us to Acts chapter number 6. And here we go. Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, that word multiplying in the Greek can, can signify many things, increasing um, also, one of the one of the notes for the Greek was to capacity. Hmm. So when we're talking about multiplying, it's like almost in certain regions, it they were going beyond even the region itself. Right. So the number of the disciples was multiplying. There arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists. Okay, let's let's start right here. The Hellenists. Right. So. First of all, can we say Hellenist? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Just make sure you say it correctly. That's right. <laughs> Grammatically correct all the way through. Don't pause and take a breath. That's right. Hellenist. <laughs> so, okay, Dallas, now uh, give us a little entry point into the Hellenists. So the Hellenists were basically, they were uh, they were Jews who, now, it goes a couple ways. Primary people go, they're, they're Jews who were part of the dispersion. They were, they're were they living in, in Rome. They're living in other areas. Yep. They've come back into here. Some people think they might have been proselytites, like they had become Jews after moving here. Right. But um, from what I've read and seen most of the time, it's they're, they're actual Jews who happen to have been dispersed out. They've grown up uh, in foreign lands, so they have Greek mannerisms, Greek mindsets. Yep. And uh, so that's who the Hellenists are. Yeah. And also... You can go to the definition of a Hellenist of a Greek-speaking Jew. Right. So not all Jews spoke Greek. Mm -hmm. So it is, um, you've got Jews who, again, like you said, they're used to a Greek culture. Uh, so you've got religious Jews, but then you've got the Hellenist, which, again, religious Jews, Hellenists didn't always get along. Right. Because, again, it says, um, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews— these are the Jewish, religious Jewish, right? by the Hellenist, a Greek-speaking Jew. But make no mistake about it, this is not talking about religious Jews who haven't accepted Christ. You're talking about those who have accepted right. Christ as Messiah. Exactly. So again, this isn't just religious Jews. These are people who are Jewish um, uh, in origin. 
yet again have some have been dispersed Greek speaking, but they are all believers. Right, which is important for us to make sure we have that context in mind of what this we're looking at, because some of us often we go, okay, you have the Jews and you have the Christians. At this point, fine, they're the one in the same. Yep. So I, you do have religious Jews who have denied Jesus, right. who have not accepted Christ, but now you have up to this point, we haven't we haven't gone to the place. Of the pagans, right? The Gentiles. <laughs> we haven't brought the gospel to these pagans because they don't deserve it. Because right. we're the chosen ones, the Jews, right? But all these Jewish people are giving their lives to Christ. I mean, this is for real. They're they're facing some persecution just by saying that Jesus was Messiah. Absolutely. So they are facing things. But even in the midst of that, now we've gotten to a place where now they're even dividing themselves. Mm -hmm. Because of culture. Right. We could actually say that. They've accepted Christ, but now culture, the religious Jewish culture, mm -hmm. the Greek culture, what they were raised in, is now beginning, they are allowing it to divide them. I think that's a key word, is allowing it in their context. That's right. So what is this complaint? The complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. And so... Uh, if you look at this time frame when you talk about widows and orphans, that was a huge, massive deal right. to make sure that the widows are being taken care of. Mm -hmm. Even to the point at harvest season where they would put baskets at the corners of the harvest fields, mm -hmm. and those baskets weren't just for those in need, but the widows got a percentage off of what that harvest was. Right. All right. If you're with us, be with us. <laughs> All right. Verse 2. Then the 12. I love this ominous, the 12. <laughs> That's a TV series, I'm sure. The, the 12. 12. <laughs> then the 12 summoned. Wow. This is like epic right here, folks. Like this, if, if this is a series, which, you know, there have been many series made by this, <laughs> right? Then the twelve summon the multitude of the disciples. Again, we're not talking about just a bunch of religious people. We're talking about Christians. We're right. talking about people who believe in Christ. They summoned the multitude of disciples and said, it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Now, let's bring this into a cultural context today, <laughs> right? So if we were to summon the multitudes and say, hey, by the way, um, hold on just a second. We don't have time to serve the tables. Right. What do you think would happen, Dallas? In, in modern day, people would be like, <laughs> we mean you're not going to help serve the table. Like, in this, like, we think of serving table like, you know, you're at a restaurant or like recently we had an event outside at our church and we were serving food. Yeah. And then that's what they mean. Yeah. So they're saying, the 12 are saying to them, listen, it's not desirable that we should leave the Word of God and serve tables. Like, we have given ourselves to the calling mm -hmm. of the Word to raising up disciples, mm -hmm. right? And in that, we have to give ourselves to prayer and we have to give ourselves to the Word. Right. They're not saying they don't want to take care of widows. Right. They're not saying they don't want to serve. Right. Because again, Acts 2, 3, 4, we see that they are encouraging one another. They're fellowshipping with one another. Mm -hmm. They're serving one another. They're encouraging one another. But we can't bring this necessarily into a right now context because the, the church is just being formed here. Right, exactly. Exactly. And I want to put this out too. The term serving tables, it's not like what we have today, of what, like we're waiting on a table, like 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 the example of serving food. Serving the table meant sitting in endless meetings to distribute business. Yeah. That's what they're talking about. Like, hey, we, we have really important things of spreading the gospel. It's really important for us to pray and to seek the Lord and spread the word more so than just doing some church management issues right now. Yeah, and this is one of the first times that we see, like up until this point, we've seen the Holy Spirit just blowing the city apart, and they're just trying to keep up right. with the number of people who are coming to Christ. They're just trying to keep up with discipling mm -hmm. new believers. Yeah, And now they're getting to the point where they're like, okay, wait a second, it can't just be us. Mm -hmm. It can't just be us like preaching and teaching we need other people. We need to start discipling people to really bring them into a place of serving, not just listening, right. but doing. Right. And so this is one of the first moments that we see, 
hey, who is among us that can really step up and go to the next level of leadership? They're not saying there's only 12 of us. There's right. only going to be seven of them. There's only going to be 12 of us for all of eternity, and there's only going to be... They're going, okay, who among us is ready to take that next step? Hey, they're serving at the door to greet people. <laughs> now they're ready to be teachers. Right. Now they're ready to do this. Now they're ready to do that. So it says, therefore, brethren, seek out from among you. Now it's talking about the disciples. Seek out from among you. Who among you? The 12 aren't saying, hey, these are the only people who are going to serve. They're saying from among you, mm -hmm. seek out from among you seven men of a good reputation. Now, good reputation. Some people would say, yeah, it's got to be somebody that the whole city loves. That's not what they're talking about. They're talking about right. from among them. Because up until this point, the disciples and the apostles don't have a good reputation. <laughs> At right? all in the city. Amongst the unbelievers, because they've been thrown in jail. But among them, right, mm -hmm. of good reputation, here's a key right here, mm. full of the Holy Spirit. And wisdom. Some key factors put together right there. Passionate <laughs> for Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, but with wisdom. I can remember when I first gave my life to Christ, I was passionate. I was on fire for Jesus, but I didn't have a lot of wisdom. <laughs> Somebody who's on fire for Jesus with not a lot of wisdom can burn a lot of things down. Oh, yeah. Right, can hurt a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And so they're being very specific here, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we, speaking of the 12, may appoint over this business. This business of what? Making sure that the widows are taken care of. So it's not that the, the Hellenists came against the Hebrews and said, consciously you're not taking care of the widows. They're just saying, with all of this that's been going on, and we're trying to keep up with all of this stuff, right. the widows are being left out in certain areas. Mm -hmm. So what do we do with this? And that's when the apostles come in and they go, okay, we need to choose other people so we can make sure the widows, it's not that they're consciously not taking care of. I think that's a key in this chapter because mm. you can read this chapter and you can think, oh, well, they were just saying the widows weren't worth it. I've heard people say that. Like uh, uh, detractors of the gospel, people were talking about the church. I've heard people use that as excuse to um, to to slam church and even pastors themselves. I'm mean, right. like, this was an act of compassion. These guys are like, hey, look, we we need mm. to delineate. We need to make sure everything's covered. Let's get some people in here to handle all these plates. We've talked about it before. A lot of people they want to be the leader until their name's on the check, until their their head their everything's on top of them. And it's like, mm. hey, you know, we have all this responsibility. And so these guys are trying to delineate. Everyone wants the title yeah, yeah. until they see the responsibilities of the title. Exactly. Right? Everybody wants somebody else's job until they find out what the other job really means. It's exactly. like it's almost like the grass is always greener, right? And you've heard me say this before. Mm -hmm. There's some super, super green grass over what? Over manure. <laughs> over manure. The septic system, right? The grass is always greener over the septic system. It's like you got to know what's underneath it. You got to know what's happening. You got to know the responsibility that comes with that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I say this all the time. As far as it has to do with what I'm responsible for in being a leader, it's not that I'm better than anybody else. Mm -hmm. It's not that I'm more talented than anybody else. It's just simply that I have different responsibilities mm -hmm. than other people in the body. Yeah. And that's really what they're saying is they're, they're like, listen, God has put this responsibility on us, not just to pray and to read the word, mm -hmm. but we are responsible for these decisions. Right. Like we're building a foundation here that is going to take the gospel to the utter ends of the earth, and we're in the beginning stages of it right now, and we need to make sure we do this right. They're not just going, hey, just pick us out some people, and let's just no, Good reputation, mm -hmm. full of the Holy Spirit, wisdom. Mm -hmm. And then we will put them where they need to be, and then all of these things will be taken care of. Right, and they're doing it on the ground floor for a good reason, so that we have a support structure. There's a um, there's a, a big-name CEO recently who's recently gone through a restructure of his whole company, and in his announcement video, he's talking about, hey, we're doing some stuff on the ground floor now because we realize these elements need to be here going all the way through as we grow as a company. And that's what these guys are doing. They're like, we need at the ground floor to take care of the widows. The, the What did Jesus say was pure... 
unrefined religion, taking care of the widows and orphans. They're taking care of that right now on the ground floor. Yep. So it's not like they're not wanting to take care of the widows or they haven't necessarily been taken care of. It's just that the Hellenists have a little bit of thing in their craw and they're coming in. <laughs> and it was probably maybe it wasn't a hundred widows. It was probably a couple that maybe the Hellenists knew mm -hmm. personally that weren't being taken care of. And it wasn't that they didn't want to take care of them. It was just that everything was going so fast and exploding. And if I'm the apostles, I'm like, look, how many of you Hellenists have been in jail so far for preaching the gospel? <laughs> like, we've been in and out of jail already. Right. Like, so I, I love the fact we're taking time to kind of walk through this and bring some clarification to this, because you're right. You can take this and go a whole different direction. Mm -hmm. Verse 4, here's what they say. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. Now, this is a big deal, because a lot of times people think— uh, they can either think one or two things in pastoring. Either we spend all of our time in prayer and the word just next to Jesus all the time and angels singing and all the, and we don't do anything else. Mm -hmm. Or you can have this idea of, well, they're a pastor and they're getting paid to this. They need to do everything. And neither one of those things is right. Right. You know, we have people that are plugged in to serve. And I've said this all the time that if somebody jumps on a mower, and mows the church, mm -hmm. then that allows me space to be able to do something else so that someone is taken care of. Right. Whether that's going to a hospital on that day, whether it's visiting somebody, whether it's praying mm -hmm. for the the hundreds of prayer requests and prayer needs that we have. Right. You know, we're not a massive church, but the reach that we have, people ask us to pray for them. They, they ask us to minister to their families, even from afar, mm -hmm. with this online community. And so in doing that, somebody mows a yard. Man, that doesn't seem very spiritual, but it opens up the door for something very spiritual to happen. Sure, absolutely. So it says, but we will give ourselves continually prayer into the ministry of the Word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen. Man, Stephen, this guy, <laughs> it doesn't give us a huge uh, context for him and his history. But just in what we see he is about to do, this is, it, he's not a character, he's a person, but I've always been drawn to him just because of what's about to happen. Exactly. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith. One translation in the Greek has faith as grace as mm. well. A man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Now, I think that's interesting right there. Mm -hmm. Because it almost gives the lean to you can be full of faith and not the Holy Spirit. And I'm I'm not saying that's doctrine or theology. I'm just saying I think that's very interesting that that word and is put in there. Mm -hmm. A man full of faith and the Holy Spirit and Philip, Prochorius, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. So there's that word, proselyte. So here we have somebody who was one thing religiously, and now is a believer in Jesus. Right. Whom they set before the apostles. So these are the ones. They said, listen, these are the ones among us, full of faith, full of wisdom, full of the Holy Spirit, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, not when they voted, <laughs> right? When they prayed, they laid hands on them. Now, Dallas, for those who may not know the inner workings and may not know the terminology of these different things. Mm -hmm. So basically, they've chosen these ones like they were asked to. Right. And now as they've chosen these ones, the apostles say, okay, we're going to pray, and then they laid hands on them. What's what's kind of the... Um, why is that significant of the laying on of hands? Well, it's a... It, there's a lot to it, but really it's a symbolism of we're, we're passing on our authority on to you guys. We're passing on... We're, we're saying, you gentlemen here... We give you the authority to operate as us mm -hmm. to speak in our name in the name of the Lord. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but to take care of business, we're we're authorizing you to take care of what needs to be done here. And um, there's a lot of scriptures about passing on mantles, and there's a lot of scriptures about laying on hands and, and praying for each other. And it's really just a passing on and authorization that's taking place. So, example, for example, uh, a lot of times when the guys uh, will go, the team will go out, and maybe they'll go. Maybe I'm out of town, mm -hmm. right? 
and you've done this many times. I'll be out of town and I'll shoot a text and I'll go, hey, I got word that such and such is in the hospital. Can you go for me? Mm -hmm. Not that you can't go in your own authority as a disciple of Jesus, right? but for certain people, certain leaders, it's important. And so you guys will go and you will come in the room and you will sometimes say, hey, Pastor Scott heard that you were here. Hey, he sent me. Right. It's not that you have my stamp on your forehead <laughs> or you need that or anything else. You're just letting them know right. that, hey, we care about this, and Pastor knows about this too. Right. There are other times where you got, I may be somewhere, I may be doing something, or somebody may call you guys and say, hey, did you know so-and-so is in the hospital? You guys may go, but you'll shoot a text to me and go, hey, mm -hmm. such and such is in the hospital. You'll go to that room and you'll go, hey, by the way, mm -hmm. we've let Pastor know that you're here, right. that you're in the hospital. He knows, he's praying. And so basically what you're doing is not allowing any room for the enemy. Right. Exactly. And we're, we're creating like almost like the, your name becomes a forerunner for what's happening here. When these guys go, oh, Peter sent them. Okay, we can trust them. That that changes things. Uh, we had something similar happen like this just a, a few weeks ago. We had a... Uh, older individual who uh, isn't able to get out, and um, we have a, a fantastic individual on staff here named Rick, who is our pastoral care guy. And we had a person that they're, they're a little, you know, they don't like talking to people sometimes, they like new people. So I called them up because I had a relationship with, hey, uh, we have this guy named on Rick, named Rick on staff. He's a fantastic guy, loves the Lord, and he's just fantastic people. He's kind of our pastoral care individual. Would you be okay with him coming and hanging out with this afternoon? And they're like. Oh, well, I mean, yeah, because they knew us. They had a relationship with us. Right. And so Rick then opened the uh, door open for Rick to go in and have a fantastic time, do all kinds of fantastic ministry with this family. Yep. And that's what's happening here is we're, we're it's becoming a forerunner of going, this is a safe person we authorize to be with you. And it's opening doors, removing the boundaries that the enemy could put in place. Yeah, and one of the things the apostles are also doing here is they're actually recognizing the call that are on these men. Mm -hmm. Like... Yes, the calling, God puts the calling on us. He, he, he puts a mantle on our lives, but then he brings people, whether it be mentors, whether it be spiritual fathers and mothers, whatever terminology you want to give it, mm -hmm. to affirm what God has already validated in our lives. Absolutely. And to say that we don't need that, I think would not only be disingenuous, but I think it would be anti-biblical. Yeah. Because in the Bible, there are people that God sends and has anointed to come alongside them, not to validate who they are, mm -hmm. not to validate their calling, but to affirm it. Yes. Listen, we all need affirmation. Absolutely. We get our validation only from the Father. Mm -hmm. We are children of God. We are sons and daughters. We, don't, we are not validated by anything that we do here on this earth. We're not validated by another person on this earth. We are only val validated through Christ and in Christ. But God brings people alongside of us to affirm what God has spoken to our hearts. Paul and Timothy, great example. Timothy wasn't his son, but Paul calls him a son in the faith. Right. Paul wasn't there to validate Timothy. He was there to affirm what God was doing in his life. That's good. And that's what's happening here. So verse 7, Then the word of God spread giving the connotation that now they've made this decision, now the Word of God is going forth even more mm -hmm. because the apostles can now give their time specifically to prayer and the ministry of the Word. Right. Then the Word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied. Now, we began this where it said the number of disciples was multiplying, adding to. This adds the word multiplied greatly. In the Greek, that is Overly abundant, mm -hmm. which means more than before. Mm -hmm. So all of these decisions that are, that are being made, led by the Holy Spirit, are increasing even more of what God was doing before. Mm. That's important. Yeah. Because they're not just making decisions around a boardroom. They're listening to the Holy Spirit. They're affirming what God has already validated. And because of that, because more people are serving, yeah. the gospel is going further. If you so want to good. ask, why should I serve? Number one, it's your calling. Right. As a believer and a follower of Jesus, it's my contention, bury me or whatever you want to do, it's my contention that serving is not a choice as a follower of Jesus. It's a calling. Right. 
It's your calling to serve. Mm-hmm. It's not something where you go, should I serve? Should I not? No, you follow Jesus. You pick up your cross. You serve. Mm-hmm. Now, a lot of people don't believe in that. <laughs> and my thing is, read the Word of God, and you contend with the Holy Spirit with that. Exactly. Because my belief is, you follow Jesus, you're called to serve. Right. But secondly, as you serve and you begin to serve, you now give that body or that community of believers, now the benefit is it goes further. Mm -hmm. The reach goes further. The net is cast wider and wider and wider and wider. Why? Because more people are serving. Man, the thing that I so loved about we had a lunch gathering, and the thing that I loved about it is people would would get there and they would go, hey, what needs to be done? It was like somebody would <laughs> grab a chair. Well, they're grabbing a chair. Well, guess what? Scott doesn't have to grab a chair because we were also doing a worship gathering. Yeah. <laughs> That's the thing I told Tanya. I was like, man... I found it a little bit hard to get my head wrapped around, okay, we're about to start a worship gathering. I've got a word from the Lord, but I'm setting a table up or I'm grabbing chairs off a thing and my head is into a lunch gathering even before the worship gathering. And and so people started coming and they were grabbing things. I could get to my office for a second and just go, okay, hold on a second. And I had like 10 minutes where I could just get my brain right and go, Okay, Lord, I want to make sure that I know what you're saying. Right. That's about to happen in 10 minutes. <laughs> right. <laughs> I want to enjoy the lunch gathering, but we're going to worship you together and hear from you first. Right. And I think it's important to see that that's what's happening here. Multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Verse eight. And Stephen, full of faith, and power mm. did great wonders and signs among the people. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Yes, the Holy Spirit did, but it says Stephen did right. great wonders and signs among the people. Right. This man is full of power, mm-hmm. and God's using him mightily. Right. What I, what I find interesting about this is Stephen was chosen for a job to feed widows, but he's not just feeding widows. He's operating in great wonders and signs among the people. Just because you've been given one particular task doesn't mean God doesn't have other things for you to so walk in and fulfill. Good. So good. There's a, there's a lot. I know I've been there where I'm like, hey, this is my job, but there's other things I got to do because it's what God's called us to do. We need to, we need to serve. Yep. Uh, we have a philosophy here at the church where... Um, you know, one week you can serve on the on the stage on the platform. Next week we might need you out there in the parking lot picking up leaves. <laughs> you right. know, it's cut why? Because there's a need. There's a well. Wait a second. I'm I'm the preacher. I, <laughs> I I preached the greatest message ever in the history of the world last week. You mean I've got to work security in the parking lot? I mean, if it's there. <laughs> well, number one, it probably wasn't the greatest sermon ever preached in the history of the world. Right. Number two, the Holy Ghost did it through the Word of God. And number three. We're not as great as we think we are, and we're not as bad as we think we mm-hmm. are, right? Exactly. We're called to serve, whether that is serving the Word of God in a sermon that's been prepared or serving the Word of God through security or in the parking lot right. or at the front doors or at my job place right. when I'm telling somebody what the Lord is saying to me and they may not even know it's the Word of the Lord. Mm-hmm. That's the whole thing. Right. And that is such a great point because within the context of church, some people can think, oh, I serve in the kids' area. Yeah. Full of faith, power. This guy's supposed to be just serving tables. Right. But he's doing great wonders and signs among the people. And it's not the 12. <laughs> it's not just the 12 so apostles good. who have been, who some, who some saw Jesus specifically yep. and walked with them. But he's, he, by all intents and purposes, he's a layman. Yep. He was chosen from a crowd. We don't know who he is. We don't know. I mean, maybe he was there for the the, uh, the rise of Jesus. We don't know. But we do know is that he was chosen out of a crowd because of certain qualities about him. Yep. And he's serving where he needs to be serving. Yep. So, and we don't, again, we don't know what he was doing beforehand. Mm-hmm. But we do know this, that God had been using him before mm-hmm. because the qualifications are, right, 
good reputation, mm -hmm. full of the Holy Spirit, and full of wisdom. Right. God had to be doing something through this man for the people to go, hey, good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom. Right. So just because you're asked to serve at a table doesn't mean that God doesn't want to just blow the place apart with signs and wonders through your life. Exactly. Man, that is so good. That just totally blows away a lot of American churchianity. Absolutely. Yeah, big time. Verse 9, then there rose, here it comes again, <laughs> then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen. Again, this is also could be called the synagogue of the libertines, mm -hmm. which has a, a, a form of uh, Libya. Uh, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from uh, Cilicia and Asia disputing with Stephen. So the synagogue of the freedmen, this takes on a lot of different connotations. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are several different interpretations of what this could mean. Some say that uh, the synagogue of the freedmen were those that were slaves under Rome, mm -hmm. uh, that were Jewish slaves under Rome. Some believe that uh, out of Pompeii, some believe that even North Africa, given the Libertines, Libya. So, But one thing that is for certain is that this group, this synagogue of the freedmen, were captives of some sort, mm -hmm. whether it have been Rome, North Africa, or wherever, and had come together in this synagogue. You anything else for that? Yeah, just I want to point this out there. By all intents and purposes, these guys were Hellenists. Mm -hmm. They were if they were if they were slaves of Rome, they probably spoke Greek. And depending on how long they were slaves, they were raised in a Greek culture. Yep. And now they're here as freemen. And they're Hellenists, which are the exact people that Stephen was originally assigned to help <laughs> and serve to. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and now they're coming against him. Right. Right after he does wonders and signs among the people. Right. Now, I did some some reading on this. There was a there was a theologian. He was a philosopher originally, and then he's a theologian um, named Dysman. Back in the 30s, he wrote about this. He found some writings. And basically, this synagogue was meant to be almost a safe haven, haven for these individuals a safe haven for displaced Jews who have come back home. Like there's literally a, a spot in their synagogue, a space specifically for people from out of town so they can find safety and, and uh, comfort while they're there in Jerusalem. Wow. Yeah. All right. Verse 10. I love this. And they were <laughs> not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Listen, as we are used by God and as the Holy Spirit flows through our life, People may not accept what we're saying. Mm -hmm. They may not accept the gospel. They not, may not accept Jesus. But there will be some who cannot resist the wisdom that comes from us, not because we're wise, mm -hmm. but the gift of wisdom through the Holy Spirit, the gift of knowledge through the Holy Spirit, the gift of discerning of spirits through the Holy Spirit. Like all of these things and the spirit by which he spoke, that they may say, I don't believe it, but man... They've been with Jesus, mm. right? Then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. Now they're appealing to the religious side. Mm -hmm. Here we go. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him, and brought him to the council. Now they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke, but yet they're still seizing him. <laughs> They're still bringing false accusations against him. Verse 13, they also set up false witnesses who said, this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And all who sat in the council looking steadfastly at him saw his face as the face of of an angel. Mm. There's a lot there. There is. I would like to just kind of point this out with this whole conversation with what's happening with these freedmen. Uh, when I read this, I had to say, why are these guys doing this? Why are they so attacking of, of Stephen and what he's doing? And there's a lot of shifting taking place. And again, if these guys are, are Hellenists and these guys are, um, they're part of what this, this temple or the synagogue was supposed to be was a safe haven for their people. What they see happening is, are we going to lose what we have here? Are we going to lose? Some of these guys, I feel like it's malicious. They're like, 
we're going to lose our power. But I feel like some of them, they're scrambling because they don't see the fullness of who Jesus is. And so they're scrambling to preserve what they think is right. Yep. And there's all that fear and that doubt. I believe that's what's leading us to what we're about to see here in chapter 7. Yep. So here we've got faith, power, signs, mm-hmm. wonders, dissension, <laughs> false accusations, um, anger, disappointment, anxiety, fear. Mm-hmm. All of that is happening at the same time. Right. And I think sometimes we think, we put it in our mindset that somehow God's going to move, and man, God's going to move, and everything's going to be glorious and wonderful, and everybody's going to agree with it, and everybody's going to accept it, but that's just not the case. That's not the reality. Mm-hmm. When the Holy Spirit begins to move, it is going to expose the motives of people. Yeah. And when those motives are exposed, then there will either be a moment for for those motives to be purified or for those motives to be used against what God is trying to do. Mm -hmm. And I think that we can take that into today. That when God moves in any scenario, mm-hmm. whether it be at your work, your school, your home, in your own family, in a church service, mm-hmm. whatever it may be, when God moves, if there are impure motives in that scenario, mm. they are going to be exposed. Yeah. And then it's up to the individual to say, man, I'm wrong. I need Jesus. Yeah. Or, no, this is too much of a threat mm. to my lifestyle or my affiliations or my traditions or whatever it is. Listen, every great revival has always confronted traditions that were not biblical. Right. (laughs) Whether that was a a church tradition, a family tradition, whatever it is, when the Holy Spirit begins moving and God begins to move, I'm talking about move, an awakening, a Mm. revival, traditions are confronted. And we've seen that with every great revival. Mm -hmm. Every great revival has brought contention amongst those who would have called themselves believers. Yeah. And here we see that here. Hellenists, Hebrews, they're all believers, but culture now has begun to divide them. Mm-hmm. Whether it be Greek culture, religious Jewish culture, whether it be political power, uh, religious power, titles, whatever, all that's being confronted here, and a lot of it's being confronted by one guy. One guy full of faith, full of wisdom, and full of the Holy Ghost. Right. He's got wisdom, and they can't even speak against that. They can't right. do anything with it. Right. To the point where when they seize him and they take control and they get him, it says that everybody that sits in the council staring at him steadfastly, and they see his face as the face of an angel. <laughs> like they're seeing the glory of God on this guy. And can't say any, they can't look at him and go, this isn't God. Mm -hmm. So the only thing they know to do is bring false accusation against him. And even that does not take the glory away from Stephen. Right. And I think that's a key takeaway for us today in this chapter, is that no matter what happened, no matter what was going on, Stephen never lost his faith, his wisdom, the Holy Spirit, right? Right the power and the authority that he was anointed with. Right. Even though everything was going against him, if God be for us, who can be against us? Mm. And so whatever you face, whatever um, whatever you come against, God starts moving in your life and you start sharing that with people and, and everything is not turning out the way that you think it should. Mm-hmm. Everyone's not accepting it. Everyone's not receiving it. Stay full of faith. Stay full of wisdom. Stay full of the Holy Spirit because God will use it. And like you said, we're going to see in the next chapter (laughs) how God moves, and it doesn't quite turn out the way that we think that it's going to turn out. Right. But we know this. All things work together Mm. for good. Why? Because we love God and we're the called according to His purpose. And that was Stephen's life in a nutshell. Yeah, Man, he loved God with everything he had, and he was called according to the purposes of God. 
And so 15 verses, man, we got a lot out of 15 verses. <laughs> Come did. on, man. We got a treasure trove of stuff out of these 15 verses. So what I want to do today, instead of just kind of signing off, I'm going to ask Dallas, uh, Dallas, if you would just kind of pray us out of this, whatever we got in our hearts today, whatever mm. the Holy Spirit put inside of us today, can you just kind of pray us out of that right now? Mm. Lord, we just thank you for your presence, your grace, and we thank you for your word. Mm -hmm. We thank you that it's challenging, that it's life-changing, and that it's life-giving. Mm. And Holy Spirit, I pray right now that we take what we've learned today, the things that we've read, and we pray that we simmer on it. Like, let it really begin to just marinate into our spirits and help us to, to recognize and see things. For those who, Lord, you've, you've placed them in the positions of leadership, give them wisdom mm -hmm. to see, to, to delegate, to, to bring up other people around them to help see the things that maybe they can't see or handle the things they can't handle themselves because they're focused on a particular mission you've given them. And God, I pray, Lord, that every one of us, Lord, that we be full of faith, we be full of your Holy Spirit's uh, power, we be full of grace. Yeah. And Lord, that we have the boldness to operate in these things, Lord. We have the boldness to see the lost, to help those who need help, and to do what you've called us to do. Yeah. And we just thank you so much for all these things. In the name of Jesus, amen. Hey, listen, I don't know about you, but I'm just glad to be a part of this. <laughs> I'm glad to be a part of something that's so much bigger than me, mm. that's so much bigger than the healing place, so much bigger than Shreveport or Louisiana. We are a part of a kingdom, right? and our kingdom has a king. And you're going to hear this a lot in the next couple of months. <laughs> leave no room for the devil and leave no doubt who you serve. Jesus is our king. Amen. We'll see you next time on the next midweek move. <laughs> yes. <laughs>